I'm okay. I'm okay. We all get them, sweetie. I, you know, I just, I feel so blessed to have had as many opportunities in my career as I have. And the fact that anything I've done has ever touched anyone is a blessing in my life. I never, I never take it for granted ever, ever, ever. It's, you know, just God has been good to me. Well, I guess I should start over. My name is Stephanie Freeman and, um, yeah, I'm hyperventilating. I'm like, oh my God, he's here. So yeah, having a fangirl moment, you know, so so yeah. But Stephen Barnes is with me today and y'all know who he is. The man is phenomenal. I mean, he's written so many books, I can't list them all. He's written Star Wars. He's written the Casanegra series. He, you name it, he and his wife, Hannah Reeve do have done just brilliant, brilliant work. And if you haven't guessed by now, I am a huge fan. And believe me, if I had pom-poms or anything else, yeah, it would be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, but welcome, welcome. We are so blessed and so happy that you're here. I'm um, happy I'm here too. And I'm sorry there was any confusion. There was a little confusion, but let's let's get into it. No questions are off limits. You can ask me anything you want. Oh my goodness. Um, Talk to us about your writing journey. Give us an idea of how you started. Oh, I started writing stories because I got tired of getting spanked for lying. I mean, when I was in elementary school, I would tell kids that I was a vampire, you know, and and my mom would go to open house and a little girl come and say, you know, Mrs. Barnes, is Stevie really a vampire? She said, no, Steve, did you say that? I said, no, mama, how could I say that? Vampires don't come out during the day. You know, so (laughs) I just realized that I had that kind of crazy mind and I learned over time that it was a way that I could make friends, keep from getting beat up attract ladies, you know, Um, and so anything that you associate pleasure with, you're going to do more of, and so I associated pleasure with writing, telling stories, and so that's how I got started. Mm. Wow. Um, Oh, gosh. Come on, Cavalcade. Come on, readers. It can't just be me having a freak out moment moment here. I'm telling you, we had this discussion. I almost had to pull her off because every time she thought about doing this, she got like here. She is, when I say fangirling, Stephen, she has been fangirling for the past month. Well, let me ask her a question then. Let me ask you, what is it about my work that you really enjoy? Perhaps we we could go down that kind of heart space thing and I can answer any questions. I might be able to intuit some questions, you know, implicit in your response. So what is it about me that you like? Oh my goodness. Um, when you write your characters, you flesh them out to the point that they're real. They're not, they have flaws. Um, oh gosh. Okay. It's, it's so let's, like- let's, let's, let's pause for right there. There's a good question. There. How do you do that? You start by designing a, a perfect human being and then you wound them. All human beings are wounded. All human beings feel fear. All of us feel alone and afraid. The only question is, what do you do with that loneliness and that fear? And what kind of lie do you try to sell to other people so that they don't understand what your vulnerabilities are? So I will take a look at at least three different areas. Their their minds, in other words, like their education, their occupation, their bodies, their physical fitness and health, and their relationship, both with themselves, with God, perhaps, with their families. A perfect human being would be, you know, would make a million dollars a year doing something that they love. They'd be married to the the love of their life and have a vibrant sex life and just ecstatic. And physically, they'd be an Olympic athlete. Okay, that's what a perfect human being would be. Anything that you see that is less than that is reasonable to assume we've there's been some pain along the way. Everybody gets banged up in life. Everybody don't ever let anybody lie to you and tell you that ain't the case. So. I create a perfect person, wound them, and then ask what kind of journey would they need to be on in order to heal some aspect of themselves? You know, th- that, that sense of I'm here, I need to be there. And then the story becomes a metaphor for the healing journey. Well, thank you for that. Now, I have a, a fellow Stephanie in the room. We're such neat people. We truly are. And she is also a fan, and I'd like to, you know, hand it over to her to ask a question. Sure, if she absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm yours, ladies. Hello. Well, he's kind of like our namesake too, right? 
Yes, he yes. is. Yes. The yes. International League of Steves and Stephanies. Yes. So what is it like writing with the missus? Oh, okay. ah. first of all, Tanana Reeve is an absolute genius. She is. She is. She, in, there in many ways, she's, I, I, and I just told her this again yesterday, I'll tell anybody, I, she may be the best prepared human being for the life she had, that she wants, that I've ever encountered, her level of integration, and you can attribute that to her mother. Her mother was an absolute lioness. I mean, just amazing. When you look at Tanana Reeve, you're looking at the love and discipline of her mother poured into one of her children. All three sisters are amazing. But um, when we started working together, one of the rules was I had a tremendous amount of experience in collaborating and she had never done it. So one of the rules is that the relationship itself is never on the table. That no matter how we fight and we're gonna fight because if you're working on something and you argue with yourself about you know this word, this theme, this sentence, imagine what it's like if you're working with somebody else. So it yes. just, it, it, it's 10 times harder in that sense. So the relationship itself is never on the table so that she is never afraid that if we have this argument, it might diminish the amount that I love her or lust after her. You know, it has nothing to do with that. This is a completely separate realm and we have to keep it separate. The other thing is that on every project, one or the other of us takes lead. If you'll notice, if you take a look at our books and things like that, like this one, Blair Underwood, um, we did with Blair Underwood. You'll notice that Tanana Reeve, it's by Tanana Reeve Dew and Stephen Barnes. That means that she wrote the first draft. The person who writes the first draft gets has the kill switch. And we might argue, but if we cannot break the tie, she gets the vote. On the other hand, some of our other works, and I'm not seeing one on my shelf right here, my name comes first. That means that I wrote the first draft. Now, we plot and plan together then one of us writes the first draft, and then the other one gets in there either as, as we go or in a, sh in a really short story, one of us might write the entire draft first and then the other one dives in. So it, it can be painful. We do better at it now than we have before, but you know, we've been doing it for 20 something years. So um, it, it, it can get, it, we try to fight fair, but, but each of us has a really passionate nature and a really clear view of what it is we're trying to accomplish. So um, it, it gets frisky. It has to, it, but there has to be a great appreciation for having a partner who understands the craft and the time that it takes to actually um, do what you all do. Because not having somebody that is not a writer may not understand you know, all the time that you have to put into not only just writing, but the the networking, the you know, the promoting, the marketing. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. And it takes a lot of different skills. The right. skills of writing are separate from the skills of marketing. They're not the same yeah. thing. No. And you'll notice that a lot of the people who became successful as writers, especially in, 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 the, in the Black community, had experience in another field altogether. A lot of them have been, you know, marketers, business people who decided they wanted to write. They came into the field with a practical sense of what it was going to take. By the way, I wanted to give a shout out to Janice Kenner. Hey, Janice, grew up friends from childhood and just, you know, um, just love you, love to the family. Um, so it, it, you need to be able to tease out the different skills and work on them separately. And no one person will have all the skills. For instance, Tanana Reeve is better at networking than I am. Um, and so she has what I would call stochastic networking. Her natural way of tweeting and being on social media and being on panels and stuff like this just sort of naturally attracts business. It's very strange to watch. Um, I don't know exactly how she does it. I just kind of take the position that she's got a little bit of magic. She does. And, and yeah. you do too. And that brings me to, to my next question. How much of an impact does um, your, your um, friendship or um, the friendship that you had with Octavia Butler uh, filter into your works? You know, while she was alive, not that much. I mean, Octavia and I lived a few blocks from each other. So we would get together for lunch and, 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 and dinner and I would take her places and so forth. And we would talk about life and about writing. Um, and 
I considered her to be a good friend um, who was ahead of me on the path and a better writer than me. Um, and now I look at her more as a big sister um, and that her purity as a writer, um, the commitment to, that she had to her craft uh, affects me more now than it did while she was alive. I, I understand a little bit better now what she meant to people. And that makes me ask myself, why did she have that kind of effect? And she, I believe she had that kind of effect because of the depth of her passion, the degree, how deeply she went into her view of the world. I mean, there are only two basic questions that you can ask in the arts or in philosophy. What, what is true and who am I? Okay, mm -hmm. and I think Octavia took those deeper than I did. Uh, and she had, in some ways, more courage than I had, because I, if I were to give my, make an excuse for myself, I was just interested in telling good stories. And I was interested in staying in the business and not having to work a second job. Octavia was a lot purer than I am. So it is only reasonable that she would, have, that she would be a better writer than me. I mean, to a huge degree, I don't believe in talent. I believe in focus and honesty over time. Mm -hmm. And she focused more of herself. She arguably focused more of herself into her work than any healthy human being that I know. She was at the edge. She could not have gone any deeper, any further, and still you know, without me being scared for her. I was a little scared for her anyway, but um, she went all the way there. So once a person's life has ended, it's possible to sort of encapsulate it and look at it and say, well, well what were they? You know, how did they achieve this effect? Why are they what they are? Why did they do what they did? How did they see the world and so forth and so on? Um, and I ask those questions now as I did not ask them before because before it was just Octavia is my friend. What can I right. do to help her? You know, what can I do to make her life better? Isn't she wonderful? I didn't analyze, I don't analyze my friends. Okay. Do you have a favorite genre that you like to read outside of what you write? I like to read uh, action adventure novels, okay. you know, suspense novels, Dean Koontz. I mean, I mean, I love I love reading horror more than more than science fiction, really. Mm -hmm. I haven't read much science fiction in a long time. I read a tremendous amount of it when I was getting started in the field, um, but not that much right now. I watch a lot of movies, a ton of movies. Um, you know, basically, you know, I'll watch about a movie and a half a day, um, it, but. Uh, Action adventure is probably what I like. I just love really propulsive plots where you put people up against the wall, you know, makes take something that they love, put it at risk, and then force them to find a way out of the box. I love that. We're getting a lot of questions on the side. If you want to, if you want me to address any of those questions, please um, you know, do that. Otherwise, whatever it is I can do for you. We've only got a few more minutes. Oh no. Yes, indeed. Yes. I would like for you to, if you see a question there to be addressed, that'll be awesome. But I just unmuted um, Lisa Dotson. Stephanie, if you have a question, this is the perfect time to jump in before we let him get off to let somebody else get a question in. Um, okay, what, which do I prefer, books or movies writing? Um, if When you can get them all the way through the process, I'm, movies. I mean, I've written over 30 books, so the thrill is gone. I mean, it's like, I love the process, but it's not like, wow, I got a book of mine on the shelf. No, no, it's like, okay, there's a book. Maybe it could be positioned better. Um, but television, I've done enough television. That's still exciting, but it's not, it's, it's not, you know, that thrill. But movies, I've never had a theatrical motion picture that really, you know, that go all the way through that process. So that has my attention right now. He's saying from that, I like variety. You know, someone asked, um, would there be some more books in the Casangra series? Uh, Casa Negra, Casa Negra series, probably not. Um, you know, there, who knows, but there's a good chance that the answer to that is no, unfortunately. Okay, so like I said, I'd like for Lisa, Anita, someone else from Tribe to get a question in. Absolutely. Did I unmute you? I'm sorry, I gotta unmute. So if you're writing horror, what is, what do you consider um, too dark? Or, or too I have scary? fewer limits. Or is limits, there a level that you limits. consider too far to go in writing horror? Um, I would say, when I think about, when I think about an audience, 
Um, there's nothing that you can't do. However, there are some things I would be more oblique about. If I'm dealing with a serial killer who is doing horrible things to children, I can have a serial killer who does horrible things to children, but I'm going to remember this is going to cause a lot of trauma and I will be oblique about it. Instead of showing it, I might have somebody talk about what they found. I might not even show the results. What I would not do is show him kidnapping a child, torturing a child, killing a child, and, you know, and eating a child. I'm not going to show that. But could I have a couple of cops saying, we're dealing with a cannibal? And we've got to catch him. We've got to stop him. Because there are horrors in the world. So I ask myself, what is the end result that I want when somebody puts that book down? In general, what I want them to feel is uplifted. I want them to feel better about the world. So if I use horror, it is to focus the attention of good people and knock them out of their game and make them make them rise up. What I will not do is use horror to tear down my audience or fear for the sake of fear. Why am I generating this emotion? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to think? When they walk, when they turn off the TV, walk out of the theater or close the book, how do I want them to feel in general? I want them to feel like life is a better place than they felt when they started. And I'm kind of a positive guy. So, so why would I want people to feel down? There's enough pain in the world. So I will deal with pain, but only as a way of helping people be strong and gain perspective. Are you working um, on a script now? Huh? Are you working on a script now? No, I'm working on about seven scripts. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always working on multiple projects, dear. Always, always, always. Um, and I, um, there are a bunch of different things and we actually are using a, a number of different methods to try to keep things in alignment. So that all I have to know is what is it that I have to write five pages on today? If I can write five pages on this today, then I don't have to worry about the fact that I've got a dozen different projects. At the moment, the little kid inside me just has to produce five pages on this. The rest will take care of itself. I gotta say, I love that short movie you guys did with the grandpa and the little Oh, girl. Danger Word. That was awesome. That was so. And we did that specifically so that Tanana Reeve would have the experience of seeing what it felt like or and sounded like to have the words she writes on the page spoken by an actor. So oh, when we were in Atlanta, I figured if I can do that, then when we get back out to Hollywood, she this can be an educational experience for her. If we had the time, I would tell you more about that process and how it was during that process that I realized my baby has what it takes that this she can do this the tension was great i mean without the, you. You, didn't need, you didn't need the zombies always constantly in your face that was right. that makes even better because zombies in and of themselves are not interesting no they're not they're not the only thing that's interesting in zombie movies are the interactions of the human beings exactly the, the zombies are just death they have no personality they're just the inevitability of death yeah. um so you know the the metaphor for zombies, you know, is is it never has anything to do with interpersonal relationships in terms of the zombies because they're not there. You know, George Romero can do some fun stuff with them. You know, and there be these zombies are shot in a shopping center, and these zombies used to be soldiers, and they still remember how to salute. You know, a few little things like that. But mostly, it's about what happens psychologically and spiritually to people when all of the natural laws of the universe have been suspended. If you think about it, there is no explanation for George Romero, you know, uh, uh, living dead type zombies. You can't justify it. It's against the laws of physics, let alone the laws of biology, let alone the spiritual principles that help us to hold ourselves together. So in any zombie movie, what you're really looking at is people who are insane because the universe no longer makes sense. So that explains all of the stupid decisions they make, they literally are out of their minds. If, if zombies existed, everything we know, think we know about physics, cosmology, physiology, all that stuff goes out the window. And what are we left with? Chaos. <laughs> Seriously. Here's a question. You guys recently did a-, um, a Twilight Zone. That was on Twilight Zone. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. I can and see your son in you when you did that. I can see the <laughs> kid in you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I the you know, like I've got three black belts, including one that's like you know at a level that I don't even like to talk about. All of that was to protect the little boy inside me. You know, when when I'm talking to you guys, we're just talking about movies and this and that. It's like, yeah, it's that little kid. The same thing. And, and you're not <laughs> talking to his daddy. If this was a business meeting, you'd be talking to his father. That's a different conversation and you're going to come correct. 
But if we're just talking about fan stuff, now we can just, we're just in the sandbox. We're talking about these things we love in this Twilight Zone. What I can tell you is Jordan Peele is the bomb. He is as brilliant as you think he is. He is as sweet as you would want him to be. And the fact that Tanana Reeve is the one who attracted Jordan Peele to her class at UCLA uh, and because she's magic. And because of her magic, we got into his orbit because we were able to, to provide him with a positive experience and, and shower him with love, which he absolutely deserves. He is that sweetheart of a guy. We were able to, and we also had done our business. We, had, we have our bona fides. We've done our work. We were able to work our way into a circle sufficiently to come up with an idea that was something that he felt would work for his show and then to execute it at a level that, was, that made it possible for them to you know, go into production with it. So you know, uh, Jordan Peele has changed the game. He deserves much respect and he is, he is as brilliant as you would hope he would be. This book right here, this book right here, this yep. is my absolute positively most favorite book of yours, hands down, The Reversal of Fortune. Yeah, mine too. Uh, it's my favorite of everything I've done. White people enslaved and black people, uh, people, Africa as the epicenter of the world. Yeah, I wonder Where why. Hell did that story <laughs> come from? Huh? Where the hell did that story come from? Um, where that came from was two sources. One was a bad movie called White Man's Burden, starring Harry Belafonte mm -hmm. and John Travolta. Uh, 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 and I thought they totally blew it. They had not actually considered their premise. Uh, the other is just, you know, the alternate history field as a whole, um, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, it's just the what ifs. And so many of the what ifs were, what if the South had won the Civil War? And then there was a television show called Sliders where every week they would move to, they would go slide to a different what if world. And they asked me if I would write one in which the relative positions of white and black were reversed. And I thought to myself, dear God, this could go off the rails so easily. So I drove from Vancouver, <laughs> Washington to Vancouver, British Columbia, Columbia in a, in a rain, rain and sleet storm uh, to meet with them personally and beg them to give me the chance to have the time to write this right if they wanted me to do it because I, I i let them see the, there are all these different mistakes you can make here and it could get bad and they this instead decided instead not to do it at all years later i decided that i would be interested in doing sort of a, in the heat of the night only in a in a reversed world right so i did i started doing research i had to do re, uh, it took me six years of research to do that book um but i pitched it to betsy mitchell at time warner books um, and she, here's a copy right here. Um, she said, well, instead of setting it during the, you know, prior to the civil rights era, roughly set it during slavery. Uh, she, she gave me enough money that I was able to, you know, for, for a two book contract that I was able to finish up my research. Um, and I put more of myself into this book that I probably will put into any book I write in my lifetime. I probably will never put as much of myself into a book again. Um, but I'm prepared to put that much of myself into a television series, you know, into a movie. It's just that the cost, the cost benefit ratio doesn't compute. When I, when I hook in the adult part of my personality, I say, how much effort did I put into that? What did I get back out the other side of it? And it's like, uh, you know, the considering if I'm in Hollywood and I've got Tanonary of doing this marketing, and we have the social skills to, to make it through these gaps, you can make 10 times as much money in Hollywood for the same amount of work. Once you get into the position, it's getting into the position to be able to do it that's almost impossible. That's where all the guardians, all the dragons, all the, all the, all the, you shall not pass are all to get, you know, to stop you from getting the position where you can sit one on one with someone who can say yes. You have to, so many hoops you have to jump through, but we've jumped through that many hoops. We're in that position finally. So it, in some ways, it won't make sense to write another book until I, I have no need for even a dollar on the contract. Then I can just do it for the sheer love of it. And I would like to, because there is a third book here in this series that is in my mind called The Bronze Nile that deals with the Civil War in that time and the, in the actual emancipation of the slaves. Um, and I might get a chance to do it as a graphic novel. John Jennings, who we're doing a, a couple other graphic novels with, 
um, might be willing to go for it. Now, one question I have is who's waiting to come up after me? Am I stealing some some nice no, ladies? No, you actually have. No, actually, it's, it's her yeah. time. But because she's over there hyperventilating and fangirling, <laughs> that's when tribe, all the tribe had questions and they were sending me that they had questions and I want to get- Okay, said, I just want to be more. as polite as possible. Anything no, no. that I can do to be of service- we got five more minutes that we can have with you. Great, be great. Awesome. So it's ask me nothing. anything you want, people. Anything you want. Nothing is <laughs> the worst is will happen. I'll say it might say, well, I'm not going to answer that. But you cannot offend me. Please okay. go for I'm it. Gonna, I'm yours. So right what's now. one lasting piece of advice? It. One lasting piece of advice. Let me give you six pieces of advice. I have a pattern that I have taught uh, to at this point thousands of writers. It has never failed to get people into the industry. And so if you will, if you'll write this down, and I mean this as serious as, as, as I possibly can. First of all, just kind of in general, join the life writing group over on Facebook. It's free. And we give advice. Oh, I'm there. I'm but the, there. the six pieces of advice are first, write one sentence every day, at least one sentence every day, no matter what. If you make that decision, you're on the path of being a writer. Okay. Two, write one to four short stories a month. You know, and they can be they can be one page short stories. I don't care flash fiction, but it's the process of writing the complete cycle of a story that will teach you what a story is and get it down deep in your gut so you feel what a story is. You cannot do jazz. You can't you can't dance as long as you're going one two three one two three. You you can't make love as long as the you're looking at the book over here at the side at the bedside. There, at some point you have to feel your way through it. And so if you do with short stories, you'll feel your way through the pattern much faster. So the so the first thing is write at least one sentence a day. Secondly, write one to four short stories a month. Third, finish your stories and submit them. Don't let them pack pile up in the drawer. Finish the stories and submit them. There are a ton of reasons. I could lecture for a month on any one of these steps, but I'm going to go through it fast. Um, the fourth step is do not re once it's finished, do not rewrite except to editorial request. Let it go. You're going to learn more by writing mm -hmm. the next story than you would learn by constantly rewriting that one story. The fear that you have that it's not perfect yet, so what? Ain't never going to be perfect. It will never be perfect. Let it go. Trust the process, not the individual products, okay? Mm. Um, but if an editor says, hey, if you change this, this, and this, I'll, I might buy this, now you go back and rewrite it, okay? So, you know, those four steps again, write at least one story, uh, one, one sentence every day, one to four short stories a month, finish and submit, don't rewrite except to editorial request. Step five is read 10 times as much as you write. There is nothing that is sadder than someone who says, I'm too busy writing to read, or I don't want to, you know, get somebody to the feeling of some other writer. That is such nonsense. Everything that you know how to do in life, reading, writing, walking, talking, riding a bicycle, you learned by imitating other people. Imitate, imitate, imitate. That's how you get it done. That's how you learn anything. You imitate it from the outside until something inside you begins to reflect what you have been imitating, and then it's yours, okay? And the last step is repeat this process 100 times. Once you have heard what I've said here, you set out a path, I'm gonna write 100 stories, I'm gonna finish them, I'm gonna write every day, and I'm not even going to, cons I'm gonna read 10 times as much as I write. So if I'm writing a short story a week, I need to write to read 10 short stories that week. That's, it's very simple. If you Steve, don't- I've got a quick question. No, no, no. Yeah. no Wait, Anita, is Nita had to hop in, Lisa, after you. I said, okay. Anita, 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 hop in. Oh, there was a question in the chat from Celia, uh, at Celia Book Maniac. She wanted to know how you felt about uh, the uh, Lovecraft series. I think Lovecraft Country is brilliant stuff. It's not perfect, but it's it's sui generis. It's, it's like nothing we've ever seen on television before. And anytime somebody is doing something that new, it's it's not standing on solid ground. What they're doing is they're skating across quicksand. They're creating images that we've never had associated with black people dealing with pains that have never been brought up and processed properly. So its flaws are ultra forgivable, while, whereas its successes are brilliant. They may be trying to do too much, but I would far rather have see, some, see a flaw because somebody shot for the moon than a success when somebody was just trying to get out of bed. You know, it's, so it's what, what we're seeing there is genius pointing the way to the future. 
awesome. Here's one person that says before Lisa asks her question and then Stephanie's gonna close us out. I've never been a fan of science fiction. This is from Dale. I've never been a fan of science fiction and fantasy because my imagination is not that advanced, but his energy is infectious. Makes me want to step outside of my comfort zone. There's two or three people who said that, you know, that they are not into science fiction, but I, I maybe need to try one. If you're going to oh, try maybe. one of his, go for lion's blood. Cause it's yes, not I would agree. It's more like you know, know. history. Awesome. Oh. My most recent novel is called 12 Days. It's, you can get it on Amazon. And, you know, it might, you know, it, I'll probably write something else in the future. But for the time being, this is the last book I'm going to write for a while. Uh, I'm working on a book with one of my collaborators, Larry Niven, but I'm doing that just for fun. You know, it, it's, it's just to be able to, to, to share time and space with a man who I love, who has meant the world to me, who mentored me. Uh, he was, you know, a rich guy from Beverly Hills. I was a poor kid from South Central Los Angeles with a, with a dream. He saw me and he, I, I have no words. I'm so fortunate for the mentors that I've had in my life. This is why I talk to you guys the way I do. I'm trying to give back what was given to me. You know, I'm a happy man. My, I actually created the life that I want. I only wanted three things in life. I wanted to be, I wanted to master writing, martial arts, and I wanted to have a family to love. I got all three. So how do you say thank you to God? You pass the gift on. Indeed, indeed. I'm going to share um, the thing that we needed to share for Stephanie, who said she doesn't mind giving up her time uh, because it was well worth it. But let's be honest, she had a fangirl moment and Tribe had to come in and do their thing, and that's fine. But uh, And I should have been tipped off because she was doing like that when she just got the notice that she was going to be doing you, but this is what her first book in the series, uh, and they can read be read standalone, is uh, Necessary Evil, book one of the Diamonds, Blood, and Shadow series. You can read them all individually. There's a uh, season of the blood that's coming out in December, November, December. Uh, so I just wanted to give a little plug for your host. Uh, so that will be in there. Stephen, we can catch you on all social media, correct? That's right. I'm always around. And I don't know, is this, I don't know if this is for a book club. Or what? I mean, I literally cavalcade of authors event that I do. This is the 16th year that I've done this. We normally okay. have an event. We so if if there is another time that you would like to have me on, and and uh, let me have the time to be able to answer everybody's questions, I can come back on another time. November. Uh, and, we're doing it in November, uh, uh, from Black Friday to Cyber Monday, and we're going to do one in Christmas, where we're okay. going to have. So I, what I need from you is for you to give me a very specific time, because when I looked at the email, I saw lots of different time choices. I got confused. I did not figure it out. Mea culpa, I'm, I'm sorry for any confusion, but if you can offer me a very specific time, I could give you an hour. Okay, I will do it by email because it was in your messenger. That's where we knocked out all the time. Yeah, you know, I said, so, so I'm lame. You know, I get, I have, I'm juggling too many things and I did not track and I apologize. It's okay, no problem. Nobody would not have known you were not on board until you said because <laughs> you were on time. So. This is kind of the way I am when, from the time I wake up in the morning. I mean, really, you know, it's just like, I, my brain just works this way. And I've actually got to slow myself down and get more into the feminine aspect of my creativity so I don't burn myself out. You know, it's, it. it's just something I'm having to do right now, but it's been an honor. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Tell Tanana Reed, do we said, hey. I most certainly will. Take care, guys. Okay, Be well. You. Thank you. Love all of you. Be Stay safe. Yes, indeed. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Okay, let's roll him to the attendee side. And all right, let me pause the recording. Hold on. <laughs>